Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to this episode of Farm Tech Talks. I'm delighted to be once again standing in for our deputy editor, Jack Kennedy, who continues to be on a few days well-earned rest. In this episode, I'm going to be joined by our beef and suckler editor, Adam Woods, our sheep and schemes editor, Darren Carty, and later I'll be joined by our dairy editor, Aidan Brennan, and Lorcan Allen, our agribusiness editor, will be talking to Rick Pedersen, president at our new ingredients in North America. Adam, Darren, before we maybe get down into the more technical aspects of what's been happening this week out on farms, both of you have been around March and out and about a lot over the last week. Adam, what are you hearing in relation to the programme for government? Because that's obviously front and centre of everybody's, all farmers' minds at the minute. It is, Justin, and there's a lot of people talking about it. And I guess when you mention the Green Party uh, to any farmer in any mart, it sort of strikes fear uh, into them as regards talking about what a Green Party could do for agriculture. But Looking at the programme for government, and it's important maybe to read that document, and, and I've read it over the weekend, and I don't think there's a lot to fear uh, from dry stock farmers' point of view. I guess there is the carbon, we'll say emissions reduction, but we have that uh, sort of dispensation there for methane that comes from cows, uh, which will hopefully, we'll say, let us out on that one. But other than that, like if, if you take the dry stock end of things, just 80,000 cattle farms, a lot of them are lowly stocked, a lot of them spreading low levels of nitrogen. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of habitats on the farm between hedgerows and, and, and we'll say areas of scrubland around that farm, we'll say woodland on those farms. So, so I sometimes laugh at some mainstream commentators when they talk about making agriculture more sustainable. But the vast majority of those dry stock farms, I don't think we could be more sustainable in what we do. And, and, and really, we, we've done an awful lot over the last few years. So, so I don't think there's nothing to fear in it. Darren, you're obviously looking after our schemes. And uh, the word, whereas, whereas Adam says the word green party strikes fear among some farmers, they get a warm and cuddly feeling when you mention the word reps. And uh, obviously, as our front page uh, story this week, 1.5 billion euros ring fence for a new rep scheme. Talk me through that. Yeah, Justin, uh, that's definitely, I suppose, on the tip of every farmer's tongue that any of the sales we've been to in the last couple of days, they're saying, what's the new reps, what will it entail? And the big question is, will it be as good as the old reps? Because an awful lot of people will remember fondly reps one, two, three, and four. Uh, and I suppose the reason that they remember it, Justin, is that there were schemes that they got paid for doing things, but they got paid for, say, maybe, uh, providing a very good environmental service and actually having a contribution to their income as well. Whereas when the schemes were replaced by AOS and, and more recently by, by GLASS, they were more a results-based scheme. And what I mean by that is that you got paid really for what you were doing and there wasn't that same capacity or same ability to maybe have money for what you were doing in general or for your environmental contribution, like say aspects such as fencing or say wild bird cover was, while they were very good in terms of say maybe generating money, say in, in theory that you ended up actually spending a lot to, to carry out the measures. So that will be the big question on this, on say the rep scheme. Uh, I do think that with the right say mechanics or with the right program, that the reps has the ability to deliver uh, majorly for sheep and beef farmers. It's like what Adam said there, is that look at farmers are aware of it. A lot of them have the capability of maybe closing off an area of the farm or told. One of the new things in it, uh, and look at, we've mentioned the Green Party there, I'd say that it could be pushed from there, is that there seems to be a big onus or a big push for planting of Broad, broad, say broad leaf trees, and look, we don't know what way that might be. There was in an old rep scheme in reps four, where a farmer would have to maybe plant uh, groves of fifty trees together, and there were say there was measures for that, and I think that that will follow along or be somewhat similar. But I think look, the the, the devil is going to be in the detail, but. With a pot of money you won't find five billion it has to be welcomed and as long as there's measures that farmers can adhere to and that they can have some contribution to income at the end of it i think they, i think we'll be happy with that yeah darren as i think as you say there that the devil will be in the detail and we'll certainly keep people uh, on our readers up to date on that detail as it unfolds but i think from what i'm hearing from both of you is that that maybe 
are we are we seeing or are we hoping to see a new dawn where where the the, the environmental agenda and the agricultural agenda actually realizes that there's a lot more to be got from working together maybe than being at loggerheads with each other and we've seen that in so many schemes where there's a whether I suppose there's a collaborative approach taken to improving water quality or whatever the case may be, that there can be real dividends got when farmers and environmentalists work together. And hopefully uh, if, and I suppose it still is a big if, if, if that new government and that coalition government is formed, that that uh, goodwill and that understanding will be carried through the, the, the term of government. Adam, uh, coming back to basics, uh, and uh, I see you have a very interesting piece there this week in relation to a potential row brune, I think is what you call it, uh, over grass fed. Surely that's a fairly straightforward one. There's probably no production model, uh, beef production model in the world that is more reliant on grass than our own uh, system here in Ireland. It is, Justin, but I guess the devil is in the detail again. Um, so Boar Bia, we carried on our Market Insight pages this week as in relation to two things. Uh, there's a PGI application uh, currently being drafted uh, between the, the Irish government um, and, and Boar Bia to, to achieve PGI status for Irish beef. Um, and there was also a grass-fed standard uh, being developed, and Chuggers are heavily involved in that uh, in relation to, I guess, Boar Bia have surveyed 13,000 consumers over the last couple of years. And what's coming out of those surveys very, very strongly is that Grass-fed resonates very well with, with today's consumer, and, and they found that 64% of, of consumers will be willing to pay more for a grass-fed product over and above maybe another product. Uh, you know, they see it as healthy, they see it as natural, and they see it as high welfare if animals are out grazing at grass. So it makes sense for us to we'll go down that road, because as you said, uh, Ireland's very well suited, our climate uh, suits it to grow grass, and a lot of animals are finished up grass. But I guess where it comes from, and this is today's consumer, the more, we'll say, questioning of what our production systems are. And it's not just good enough to sit out and say, well, look, at our, our animals are grazing across the hills. It's all grass-fed uh, by it. We have to provide proof. And this is where the standard has been developed from. Um, so Chagas have done some work on this. And basically, 90% of the animal diet uh, over the lifetime needs to come from grass. You're talking about 220-day uh, grazing season. Um, and the big issue uh, that has come out of it, and the IFA have come out very strongly on it, is bulls and the exclusion of bulls. Now, over the last couple of days, we've got some clarification from Borbia in that bulls can be eligible uh, if they meet those eligibility criteria. And I guess there's two sides to this. We need to be careful that we don't just, we'll say, create another brand in terms of grass-fed and that anything gets into that because we can't differentiate it then. And it really, it's a weak brand. Whereas if we hold up there that, that it's actually measurable and it's delivering and, and it does what it says on the tin in terms of grass-fed, uh, then we'll say we, we'll get possibly a premium for it. But yes, bulls is, is the big one, and, and bulls have created a lot of controversy over the last few days. Adam, I think you touched on what is a fear among a lot of farmers is that we go up this standard, we reduce an extra standard, but it ends up becoming the baseline and everything is cut back from that. Is that legitimate? It is, Justin. We need to be really careful that we don't create another tier in the pricing, we'll say, models of factories that they use this as, a, as another tier. And, and we have no, I suppose, would say foresight on, on where that premium has got. So so if we if we have this this premium and it belongs to the factories, they get a premium for selling that as grass fed, what does the farmer get? And I think the farmer needs to own this premium and the farmer needs to, to own this grass fed and, and know what's to be got out of it. If, for example, the Angus premium maybe is 10 cent, maybe is 12 cent. We need something similar to that, that it's actually, it's, it's a visible premium that the farmer gets. Adam, you're doing bulls in Tullamore. Uh, do you reckon you could actually, if it was a 90% lifetime gain from uh, our lifetime feed intake from grass or grass forage and a 10% from concentrate, do you reckon, maybe not at the minute, but with tweaks to the system, you could work that, you could work with those uh, conditions? It'd be really tight, Justin, and, and we, we'd have to have everything right along the way. You'd have to be taking your bull cap probably off your cow at 400, 450 kilos. Uh, and it might be only a select few that meet that criteria because maybe the lower performing ones that don't do as well on the cow um, and, and don't do as well over the winter maybe won't hit it. But I think it's important that it's there for us to work to. And possibly maybe if we, if we use Angus, we've seen Angus maybe two years ago that we were able to get those bulls out of maybe 13 months, 14 months. Um, and maybe if we looked at that again, possibly, be, as you say, tweaking the system, uh, we could hit some of those targets maybe, yeah. And I think that's the key. And in fairness to Board Bia, in discussions with us uh, this week, they did outline that if farmers could prove that they were meeting those standards and those requirements, that they would look at the bull issue. So I think that's, that's a positive development. Uh, Darren, on, maybe on a slightly more negative, and we're, we're looking at uh, on the beef side in terms of our exports, but you had a bit of worrying news there, I see, in relation to New Zealand and trade deals being done with New Zealand. 40,000 tonnes of uh, TRQ-free uh, lamb coming into Europe. Maybe just talk us through that a little bit more. 
Yeah, so Justin, usually it's, say, Mercosur that's dominating the headlines. And, and you say, sh sheep meat generally isn't, uh, I suppose, on the, on the agenda for coming into Europe. But uh, we've we seen leaked documents uh, that were reported in Agrifax and say the European Commission is looking at potentially offering another 40,000 tonnes phased in over 15 years. Now, if we look at, say, what's there already is New Zealand already enjoy the best access to the European markets worldwide. So they have a tariff-free quota already of just over 228,000 tonnes. Uh, if we go back 10, 12 years, they were filling that every year, so they were, because uh, the EU is the highest value market for them. In the last six, seven, eight years, they have dropped the percentage of what they're filling, and they're now filling, last year, they only filled 50%. So I, the, one of the things I think is that maybe the EU are saying, well, look, it's not going to, if we offer them this more, it's not going to have an impact. But who's to say in a few years' time that, that say, the Chinese markets won't dip? or the other markets that New Zealand is currently going into, and it gives them 40,000 tonnes extra. Like, to put it in perspective, Ireland exports about 50-odd thousand tonnes, give or take, in a year onto the European market. Uh, say, the UK, and we don't know what way things are going to go after Brexit negotiations, exports somewhere between 80 and 90,000 tonnes. So now, this say, New Zealand would have... Uh, a combined access of three times the, the, the amount that the UK would be exporting into, or like it, it did have five times the amount of Ireland uh, can export. So like it's massive figures what we're talking about and it doesn't really make any sense. So it doesn't uh, like the one worry I'd have as well is that while this may only be talked about is that if New Zealand did get the uh, granted access, this Australia are also knocking on the door trying to get more access to the EU market. And like we have to, I suppose, maybe protect our markets. Yes, we have to also say, I suppose, maybe trade on a, on a global scale that we're looking for access into China, we're looking for access into America. So look, we have to be realistic too, but to, to say to increase the tariff, when the, the tariff say quarter, when there's no need, just seems nonsensical. And I would be worried too that New Zealand actually don't really want to push for this, but they're pushing for more access for beef. And there isn't a lot of talk about this at the moment. Like the figure quarter would be 3,000 tonnes of beef. New Zealand are looking 50,000 tonnes worth of access. So like it, it isn't maybe being highlighted, but down along the line, it's something that we're going to have to look at more. Uh, and like I would be saying, this, the one thing we get sorted first is what happens with the EU, say, UK uh, trade deal. Because, say, historically, the UK would have bought half the New Zealand, say, quarter into Europe. <clears throat> and what the EU and the UK are sort of pretty happy that on exiting Europe, this Ireland, or say, or say the EU would, would say remain with... 115 odd thousand tons the uk would have 115 odd thousand tons but new zealand don't want that either they want that to be able to switch or alternate between the boat and that would be a worry as well adam uh or sorry darren i'll actually stay with you in relation just maybe on on uh down on the farm level i see you have a nice piece in this week's uh farmers journal on you're starting to wean the lambs down in tullamore farm yeah, uh, I suppose, Justin, it's a, it's a decision that was enforced upon us that we were trying to give every chance so we were for grass growth to recover. We were, Sean was hoping for rain at the weekend. It never came. He did a grass cover there on Tuesday and it showed this growth to drop to 30 kilos. Demand is running at 45 and his average farm cover is only about 650. So it didn't, there wasn't, say, too much, I suppose, options for him. The way we looked at that, it is, is this the intake capacity the O at the moment is somewhere between 2.3 and 2.5 kilos of dry matter. Lambs are getting to a stage where they're eating 1.1 to 1.2 kilos of dry matter. So by weaning the O's, we could buy another day for every two lambs extra. And like Sean probably has enough grass for the O's for maybe seven, eight, ten days if we were to leave yours with lambs by doing this we've pushed that out to maybe 14 or 15 days it still is tight uh, uh but it does buy us a bit of time and it gives us extra options so probably what we're going to do is introduce concentrates uh today roughly around 250 to 300 grams per day per lamb see how grass growth goes over the next few weeks and make decisions on that if grass improves We'll probably leave it at that level for now. We found that given that level in recent years, it has helped to finish lambs. 
if growth stays very tight, we'll probably split up the lambs, increase the, say, feeding rate to the ram lambs to a half a kilo to 0.6 of a kilo and leave the old lambs where they're at. What we found in recent years is when we increased it across the board to yours and ram lambs, the old lambs tended to go over fat. So look at it, I suppose it's a case of uh, wait and see for the next few days how it goes. Do we get that rain? But look at Adam will know there that Sean has taken all of the, say, the precautions or the options that he can. He's feeding silage and hay to cows. And even if we do get rain, it's going to be 10, 12 days before you get back on stream, I think. Uh, Adam, go, going from the, the sheep to the dairy beef, I see Declan Marin has uh, wait, wait, has been weighing the cattle down on the farm, our Thrive Farm down in Tipperary. Uh, good performances there, 100 kilos in nearly four days. Yeah, pretty good, uh, Justin. I would say even the calves, I think, 0.8 of a kilo since they came onto the farm. Um, and, and they're on target. Uh, we'll say we reckon we should have 70, 80 percent of those animals, uh, the bigger animals, finished off grass uh, by the end of the year. And that's important because we've seen in the past, whereas once those animals come in, um, in terms of feed cost, silage, and meal, they really don't cover in terms of the weight gain that they're doing. So, so that's our target to get as much as possible off grass. And I think maybe we, we'll window it a bit of feed a little bit earlier this year. So we make that decision in another month or so. Um, grass is, is quite good actually on, on John Halley's, it's not bad, uh, we've got good coverage of grass down there, he got some rain unlike Tullamore, um, so hopefully they'll keep thriving. Yeah Adam, one of the other stories I see you're covering there is the 50 million uh, beef fund and obviously it maybe is slightly overshadowed a little bit by a 1.5 billion uh, rep scheme but still nonetheless a very important uh, fund for farmers, how do you see that being paid out? That's the big question Justin and it's a big question every farmer's asking I guess who's going to get it and how much is it going to be? Uh, we've looked at it this week in terms of different scenarios. I suppose there's some people saying it should be over all the cattle kill, that was killed in 2019. That'd be about 1.7 million cattle, and, and the payment rate will be down at maybe between 20 and 40 euros on that. And I don't think that would be really justifiable in terms of you know the losses that have been made by winter finishers. So if we crank it up, then maybe to go from January uh, a right up to we'll say starting in March uh, up to up to we we'll say the 15th of June, uh, you're looking at maybe 100 120 euros payment. I think it needs to be around 100 euros. People got, we'll say, bean money last year. It was a hundred euros. Um, I think speaking to, we'll say, people in the know, I think it'll be somewhere around there. Uh, so it'll be based on the number of cattle that, that was killed in the last couple of months. It needs to go to winter finishers. I think they have really lost their short uh, in the last couple of months in terms of finishing cattle. I think it's really important that that's paid out maybe in September if we can at all, because I've seen a lot of criticism there for the department and, and on, on the beam scheme. It came, the payment came out around the 19th of December a long way past wheeling sales and store sales and if these winter finishers could have that fund i suppose in their pocket in september well there's a chance maybe that they'll go that bit more maybe on wheelings and stores uh, next autumn so i think it's really important that it's paid early darren look a lot of a lot of stuff about technical stuff and, and, and money but i think you've you have a really interesting story uh, on the buildings page this week on a farmer in galway who was agitating a slurry tank and there's a real safety message that i, I think is for, certainly well worth highlighting let me just uh, talk us through that situation gang slats lifted off off 10 to 12 inch or centimeters or inches sorry off the ground what, what happened there and what, what's the advice to farmers yeah justin it's something that i found hard to even comprehend comprehend in my head until i actually went and saw it it's the farmer doesn't live too far away from me and he gave me a phone call that he wanted to raise awareness for other farmers uh, essentially he agitated the tank to say today uh, it was tick slurry and he had plenty of room in it. It was say 10, 15 inches from the top of the, for the bottom of the gang slats. So there was rain forecast. He does collect some rainfall off the roof, say for, as a backup for, for drinkers. So he decided that, look, at he'll divert that into the tank for a few days. Uh, there was a small drop of rain, wasn't a huge amount. So he said, look, at he leave it for a couple of days, give it a spin again and then maybe spread it. But when he, when he arrived back in the tank a couple of days later, uh, he seen that they, there was just foam met him, say the slurry was coming up to the manholes at the uh, edge of the shed. Uh, he could see foam over the slats, couldn't really see the slats, but knew that they were maybe higher than what they should have been. And essentially what happened was, we seen it back in 2014, is if you get warm conditions, you can sometimes get a reaction of methane producing bacteria. It can be very vigorous. We haven't seen in other cases where it's lifted slats, but in this case, it'll lift the slats along one side of the shed up to 10, 12 uh, inches off the, off the tank. Thankfully, it went down slowly again. Uh, so that the, the say slats came back down on top of the tank without going into the tank because that would have been a pure disaster altogether but it is likely that he's going to have to lift him off now there still is a few of them maybe four or five inches up 
the slurry gone in underneath that and they probably won't go back down but look at the farmer himself is happy uh sean morn is the man's name he said that look at no one was hurt no one was uh injured in it uh he he say did what i suppose you'd be advising everyone to do he kept well clear off the shed so he did uh waited for the stats to go down he's going to wait another few days empty the slurry lift the t- lift the slats and see like there was a case in 2014 where uh, a farmer had that happening on an ongoing basis where there would just would be bubbles coming up to the slats and he was doing a bit of work he'd have he'd a man in uh, with a welder there was also a, a case in sligo where there was a man in with an angle grinder uh, and a spark caught, uh, say ignited the methane gas that was coming up and uh, like you, you could get a case where there could be, if there was a pocket of gas, you could get an explosion. Or in them cases, there was a lot of damage done to rubber mats. And also, I suppose this, there is a, a safety risk that if you do get a, a, an ignition like that and you're anywhere near it or you're working with equipment, it could lead to a lot of dangers. Like I suppose a lot of farmers will be spreading the slurry this week, given that there's rainfall. And it's back to the same message, just that nobody should go and should be going into a shed where there's agitation taking place. One of the things that we often get calls about is when there's a manhole cover open, that a dog falls into it and it puts everyone's health and safety at risk. So it's just taking the simple, I suppose, steps. Uh, people will see in the video there what we uh, say that farm has been left uh but it's just look it's it's, it's there's been too many accidents this, this year and to think before you do enter and i think that's a good opportunity guys to highlight the the embrace supplement we have in this week's farmer's journal obviously a, a lot of very poignant stories in that and i think a good way to, to end this section in terms of what a very important safety message as darren says a lot of but hopefully more rain forecast slurry going out agitation taking place and it is a dangerous process and just our air caution Adam, Darren, look, thanks very much, guys. Uh, what they call it. Uh, just, uh, Adam, what have you coming up in next week's paper? Yeah, so we're going to look more maybe at this sort of, uh, you know, grass fed and maybe talk to Chagas on, on as regards what, what, the, what the detail is around that Chagas or the grass fed standard. Um, we're also starting a beef series. So, so there are a lot of, uh, we'll say, requirements there to the beef program. And we want to kick that off next week with Wayne and on how farmers can guarantee payment and full payment on the beef scheme. Darren, what have you coming up this week? Yeah, so Justin, what I have this week is there's a buildings focus, a lot of good information on that. We have a Chagas report on how the better farms are doing, say the sheep performance on that. And we're also back with our Northern Ireland sheep program. Uh, Kieran Maley has a good update on, say, what the farmers are doing to get back on track after, hopefully, after they get rainfall in the coming days. Darren, Adam, look, thanks very much for your time. And we look forward to touching base with you again next week. So delighted to be joined now by our dairy editor, Aidan Brennan. Aidan, I was speaking with Adam and Darren earlier on in relation to just maybe before we get down to the technical aspects of this week, uh, the programme for government. What are dairy farmers saying in relation to the programme for government? Yeah, sure, Justin, I suppose not too many dairy farmers are all that engaged with it, you'd have to say, uh, at, at the moment. Uh, I mean, the details of it are fairly benign, uh, you'd have to say, from the outside. Um, in terms of dairy, just just yet anyway. Okay, look, the nitrates directive, uh, nitrates derogation is up for a review. Probably going to happen anyway, you know, and not into a new unit. And the fact that uh, biogenic methane is is being treated separately to other greenhouse gases. So, I suppose they're the two main things that that the majority of dairy farmers will be will be looking at looking at. Um, and, and there's no real changes there. So generally, like I mean, I suppose it 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 depend on what's going to happen in terms of the the party voting uh, as to whether that that the the program is actually going to be adapted or not. A lot of farmers are, are that I'm talking to are saying, you know, it's hard that, to see it um, crossing the line. Um, so look, I mean, wait and see, but not not a whole lot of of uh, dissenting voices just yet. Just you'd have to say. I suppose the attention for farmers now Aidan, has been one on, on milk price and I suppose uh, most of them will be happy to see uh, the main milk price stabilising but also the arrival of rain uh, will certainly uh, be welcome for a lot of for a lot of, a lot of farmers in general but a lot of for, for dairy farmers as well. What advice are you giving farmers now Aidan, that the rain has arrived? Yeah, so I mean, the, the important thing to remember though, Justin, that rain has only just arrived for a lot of farmers. Like, I mean, I, I talked to a couple of guys up around the, the Midlands uh, and, and across to Galway, uh, like, you know, only the very small quantities of rain fell up to up to today at least. Now, you know, there's there's been a good bit of rain since then and there's more coming uh, tomorrow and, and over the weekend. So you'd be hoping that um, that most farmers at this age would have got a, a, at least 10 or 12 mils of rain. Um, but really you need 25 mils or 30 mils to get any really noticeable change in terms of grass growth and uh, 
to help to um, I suppose move you know to, to, to improve the soil moisture deficit situation. The advice is uh, is very depending on what position you're in. So if you've uh, got a decent amount of rain and uh, have a decent amount of grass in the farm, you need to be watching quality. So that means you know skipping over paddocks that are gone too strong. Um, you know you could potentially go topping after after grazing if if you if you have if you can't afford to um to to, to take out paddocks for silage. Um, they are the kind of things in order to improve quality because quality is poor on you know because grass has been stressed for so long. Uh, the other scenarios then, Justin and I've, you know, we've we've gone into detail on these in the in the journal this week. Is um those that have got a good bit of rain but are low in grass because they let farm cover run down. They, those farmers now need to slow up the round big time. So you're putting in an awful lot of feed here. You're talking about putting in five or six kilos of nuts, uh, another five or six kilos of dry matter of silage, and probably only being only get you know five or six um kilos of grass per day for the next you know they've probably been doing that now for the past week or so and they're going to keep going at that until the farm cover rises and it's actually very important to do that because there's a really good return on investment from um slowing down cows after a drought with putting in the feed then um because you're you know you're like you're, you're kind of catching the wave of growth that's going to rise um over the next week or so because of the rain has come and there's you know there's plenty of nitrogen plenty of nutrients in the soil for for good growth rates you'd have to say for the next few weeks um so that's kind of where a lot of farmers are they're either in those two categories and then there's more than are you know they're only just have to get rain so they're going to be in category uh the second category there that i spoke about i spoke about um over the next few weeks so Aidan, i think the key thing i'm hearing from you there is get out and assess the situation on the farm and see i suppose what category uh you fit into in terms of what uh, the advice that you outlined there there's no there's no one one cap fits all in terms of when it comes to how farmers should be responding now at the minute no, that's definitely uh, correct, Justin. And like even within the parish, there's differences between farms because the way the rain has been falling for the last few weeks has been really localized. Uh, I know in my own situation, I could see rain falling a couple of fields away, but it's not coming here, and vice versa. You know, so it, it's very much farm specific. It, a lot of it depends really on your stocking rate. If you're highly stocked uh, or higher stocked than other people, at least, then it's it's you know the effect of the drought was worse because you 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 ended up eating more grass, and it's there's going to be less grass there. Results going to be longer for that to come back. So every farm is different and it needs to be managed uh, differently. But um, the key thing, as you say, is to walk your farm. Ideally, you'd, 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 you'd measure that grass, you know, put the figures down on it, look at uh, look at the growth rates, look at your demand and make, you know, uh, really informed decisions as a result of that. But even the, the by virtue of walking the farm, you get a better picture of, of where things are, you know, and, and do that every couple of days, particularly if you're putting in, a lot, putting in a, lot, a lot of feed because there's a huge cost to that. What about going in, out with nitrogen in? Yeah, yeah, I, I think now is the time to do it. Um, so the rain has, has come. Um, look, there is, you know, there's probably not a big shortage of, of, of nitrogen in the soil. Uh, although I, I walked the farm the other day and uh, you could see where the, the farmer missed, you know, the fertilizer the last time around. So, you know, there was there was kind of uh, yellowy, light green patches there where the nitrogen was missed. So that just indicates that the nitrogen that was applied is, is, is having a, an effect in terms of growth rate. But um, look, don't go over the top. Uh, 20 units is probably sufficient, I'd say, for the moment, um, and go again in a few weeks' time or, or after grazing. But um, yeah, I, 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 that was the time to go at it because um, if, provided that you've got rain, um, rain was limiting growth up to now, not necessarily nitrogen. Now it has, the soil has moisture, so nitrogen and other nutrients would be, would be the limiting factor. You mentioned quality earlier, Aiden, uh, the dreaded topper, yes or no? Well, I, I mentioned topping, and I normally would not never uh, suggest that farmers should be, should be going topping. But like, like I suppose the difference now compared to, we say, twenty eighteen or our previous droughts is that we're still early in the year. Like, so you still have half the month of June, all of July, and follow on then into autumn. So there, you know, you will need good quality grass for the next couple of months. Um, I, I don't like topping. It wastes grass. It reduces subsequent growth rate. It kills a bit of re, you know, knocks regrowth off grass. But it's it's it can be used effectively um, at at certain times, uh, and maybe this is the time to do it. Um, I'm not I'm not as against it as I would ordinarily be, um, provided that you go in straight away after after grazing and you're not hitting regrowth. If you're hitting regrowth, then don't do it. Leave it, leave it in the shed. Um, but it, and, and make sure you get your, your your height right. Like you need, for topping, topping shouldn't be cosmetic. And I'd say ninety percent of the topping that goes on around the country is just purely cosmetic. It doesn't get the 
the, the, the growing height down low enough. So that should be between three and a half and four centimeters. Um, and that means, you know, you're removing a nice bit of stuff there if there's a lot of stemmy and, and bad on material at the bottom of the base. Um, it, it does have a role to play there, but the preference will be that you, you, you'd skip paddocks that are gone stemmy and convert them to, to bale silage or, or pit silage. At least then you're not wasting any feed. You've got a nice clean cut and you're not uh, going to hit any regrowth. In uh, young stock on the farm, how should they be uh, managed at the minute? Yeah, uh, I mean, the calves will, will need to be watched closely. So ideally, if there's aftergrass coming back into play, which would be the case now on a lot of farms from, from first cut, uh, I'd be giving them the, the, the preference there will be for the, the, the calves to get access to that. And if they have plenty of aftergrass and good quality grass, then, uh, you know, they don't need concentrate, provided that they're up to target weight. If they're under, under target weight at this stage, um, and, you know, there are calves out there that are, especially the, the younger ones, then I'd probably be giving them a kilo or a kilo or half of meal, along with the best quality grass available. They're the, they're the key ones. Uh, and in the next age category, so you're, you're at, you know, you'd be hoping you're in calf heifers now. Um, they will need to be treated for flies in order to prevent any uh, summer mastitis. And keep an eye on them if there's if there's heifers. Um, you sometimes see this time of year now with heifers sucking other heifers, like bad habits from, from being calves. That's going to, you know, increase the chances of those heifers that are being sucked of getting something like uh, summer mastitis, um, which you don't want to be getting. In in terms of reseeding and maybe some guys midsummer reseeding, uh, talk, contemplating reseeding a few paddocks towards uh, the, the end of the grazing season, would you be saying to hold off on that at the minute? It's a funny one. I was considering this myself the other day. A, a farmer asked the question, like, we're kind of going to probably experience a, a, another spring at the moment because, you know, growth rates have been poor in a lot of cases up to now. And now after getting rain, they're going to get a, a big burst of growth. So there possibly is an opportunity to get some receding done. But I'd say you want to be fairly sure that you're going to get rain for the next uh, six weeks after sowing. And farmers in the east and, and, and parts of the south can't be, can't be guaranteed of that. Um, so I, I'd be wary of it, depending on your location. But if you're if you're pretty sure you're going to get rain and you're, you're confident in that, then uh, it's a good time to get it done. Uh, for, look, for me, the preference is always spring receding. Your uh, and then the next preference, and after that, then is autumn receding. And now you're suggesting kind of a midsummer receding, which is a little bit unusual, but it's it's an unusual year, so perhaps it's the time to do it. Um, it can be done, just you know, buyer beware, I suppose. Aidan, what's your agenda for uh, for next week? What are you looking at next week? So I'm actually on my way down to, to, to Moor Park, uh, in, to Chagas Moor Park tomorrow, and we're looking at uh, over and clover. Uh, back to your seeding thing there, Justin, like, uh, I mean, now is a good chance to get clover seeds in. Um, look, all the talk for the last couple of months and years, in fact, as well as is in terms of reducing nitrogen usage, this is something that can be done to achieve that. But there are obstacles in the way of, of getting clover in. It's not easy to do it. So I'm just, um, I suppose, looking down, going to talk to the researchers uh, and, and, and I suppose challenge them to come up with ways that we're going to get more clover into farms and, and, and how it's going to be managed um, afterwards. So that's kind of the, the plan for next week in the, in, in the Farmers Journal. OK, thanks for that, Ian, and look forward to catching up again next week. Earlier, ladies and gentlemen, Lorcan Allen, our agribusiness editor, caught up with Rick Pedersen President of Global Ingredients in North America for our new. Let's hear what he had to say. Would you maybe explain to our viewers today just what exactly is Ornua's business in North America? What is it you do and what are the ingredients that you manufacture and sell? Yeah, sure. Uh, so North America Ingredients uh, has two manufacturing facilities in the Midwest of Wisconsin, producing functional cheeses, mostly processed and imitation cheeses. Uh, that go into the the business to business world or go to the manufacturers of brands. Uh, really, our cheeses are going into a, our, our our customers' products as more functional types of cheeses. So things like pizzas, handheld meals, sauces, soups, things of that nature. Rick, maybe just to 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 another area that farmers may be aware of in Ireland. I mean, we sell a lot of Irish butter into the U.S., uh, particularly to our Kerrygold brand. It's it's been very successful for us over the last number of years. Uh, back in October, November last year, uh, the U.S. Uh, administration uh, placed a 25% tariff on, on Irish butter coming in. Can you just maybe explain uh, a little bit about the tariff, uh, why it was implemented maybe, and, you know, is this something that's here to stay or is there a bit of hope that that tariff can be maybe, you know, removed eventually or, or what, what, where, where are things with it at the minute? 
and, and of course, I'll be a bit careful here because we tread into some political ground, which is always a, a bit dangerous. But I would say what, what brought it on was really a change in policy. So uh, as President Trump came on, he took a very firm stance on trade deficits, starting with China, but also with, uh, with Europe. Um, in terms of trying to rebalance the, the trade deficits that, that the U.S. was seeing. Um, so that trade policy is really what drove uh, the decision to, to add those tariffs uh, to, to Irish butter and, and European uh, products. Uh, in terms of when that might come off, uh, no real indications of when that is. As I think as long as President Trump is, is in office, he'll, he'll likely maintain those, those elements. We are in an election year. We're circa five months away from uh, our next presidential election. And that's probably the next key date for us to watch that the outcome of that election is uh, is likely to set the direction on what happens with our trade policy going forward. Um, and maybe just moving away from from dairy, uh, maybe a broader question about, um, you know, where is America today coming out of the lockdown phase? I mean, Americans value their freedom. They, they value being able to get, you know, they like to work, get their economy back on track. Where are things, uh, where's, what's your sense of what, where America is today and, um, you know, the reopening of the U.S. economy? Yeah, that's a big, big question for us. Uh, so as I said, all, all 20 or sorry, all 50 U.S. states have, have either uh, fully reopened or at least partially reopened. So we, we, we are live for business and, and things are moving forward. Um, you know, across the course of this, since mid-March, we've had uh, nearly 46 million people file for unemployment. Uh, and last week alone, we had an additional 1.5 million people that have filed for unemployment. So uh, projections are somewhere in that sort of 12 to 15 percent unemployment uh, rate, which we would have been prior to this at 50 year lows at around sort of uh, the mid threes to four. Um, so we've seen a lot of unemployment that's come back. So in terms of the, the economy, there's a good number of people who have seen their incomes significantly impacted and or now being supported uh, by, by government programs through unemployment. Uh, stimulus checks, things of that nature. So in terms of getting the economy back to it, um, I think it'll be a couple of things. One is is consumer confidence. So uh, in terms of consumers uh, going back to not only restaurants and the confidence of being in a public space, but also as you see that the economy is, is in trouble, um, do you make major expenditures on things like homes and cars and things of that nature? So the question will be consumer confidence. Does that really come back to us in the next six months? Uh, to really spurn the economy or does it not again we're in a in an election cycle here and uh the, the current president's really putting a lot of emphasis on the strength of the economy prior to covid and uh, all indications are is that he would like to see a strengthening an economy going into the election um, so there'll be probably be some things that occur that that look make the economy look and feel like it's strengthening. The question is those underlying fund fundamentals of, uh, of consumer confidence. Uh, my, my sense about it is it's going to take us a good six months to a year before people really get their feet underneath themselves. Okay, thank you for that, Larkin. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That brings our farm tech talk for this week to a conclusion. I'd just like to thank our sponsors again, MSD Animal Health, Orbia, FBD, and Ornua. Stay safe, safe farming.